Thank you for having me uh, here today. Um, and uh, yes, so do I just push this? Yeah. All right, there we go. <laughs> Uh, my name is Amy Shacklin. I've been uh, the director of United Housing for just over a year now. Uh, I did work there uh, for around six years for its founder, um, Tim Bolden, uh, for a while, and then I went and worked with Debbie Reeves over there at THDA for a little bit. Um, but I'm happy to be back, and uh, we are 25 years old this year in August. We turned 25. Um, and we've helped over 9,000 folks. They've come through our program, uh, either home buyer education or the counseling program. And we helped almost 5,000 folks buy a house um, in Memphis, in Shelby County. Uh, so, yep, yeah, that's that part. And our mission is uh, to provide quality housing opportunities. Uh, we've done this historically through mostly home buyer education, home ownership counseling. It's very uh, home ownership centered. Um, and we still believe in that. We still do that today. Um, and we have quality housing because, you know, affordability, there's a lot of affordable homes, um, if you call it that, but the quality of a lot of them are not there. Um, we have a very uh, substandard rental problem, uh, rental houses. And so one of the things that United Housing has been doing is acquiring and renovating homes for uh, rent that are accessible to individuals with disabilities. And I'll get into a little bit more of that. Uh, we also provide um, financing for home ownership. We've done the financing assistance uh, a lot in the past, and now uh, we're offering that first mortgage, which I'll get into that later as well, uh, along with um, home repair uh, funding. So last year, 831 families went through our program, 267 bought new homes, and we helped save 94 homes. Uh, Families were losing their homes to foreclosure. Um, I see Nadia in the back, and she was really instrumental in helping us do that uh, through uh, the loss mitigation. Loan modification. Uh, over the past few years, we've won three hundred thousand dollars in down payment assistance. We've done seventy first and second mortgages for a total of one point six seven in, in homes in this county. Um, and our first mortgages are usually around zero percent delinquency. They're the you know, ones that. that a little bit higher, but mostly it's always in the court. Um, we really work with our families, we talk with them. Um, we want to make sure that they're successful and sustainable long term homeowners. So, we've done some number crunching, and the average that we looked at uh, $108,000. Um, that mortgage came in at 60, 650 to $750, depending on a few different things which lender you work with, rate, where you live, insurance. Um, but most of the families that were paying this already in rent um, or, or more. Uh, so it is um, something that we're really proud of, and that's Priscilla there talking with Tommy, who is a veteran, and he owned his first home uh, for the first time. Uh, last year, uh, we renovated, actually, we just sold our this fourth home this year. Um, we renovated four homes in Raleigh and, and Frazier. Uh, they were sold at average price of 47.4, so the payment was very low. Um, and just is really, I mean, that's affordability and it's quality. Uh, we did the renovation, uh, it's energy efficient renovation, um, mostly new appliances. We, we don't get the washer and dryer, but we can put in the, the refrigerator and stove and all that. So um, that's affordability or quality. Um, Austin is going to go into this, so I'm not going to take this thunder. But what we're talking about here is that we've had historical disinvestment in our. Uh, poor neighborhoods, and that's on the left, and that's history, but that's still playing out today, and on the right, those are the loans that were made, the first mortgage was made between 2011 and 2015, all the dark colors is where the not was made, and that is, of course, along the Poplar Corridor now east. Um, we've got to do better, um, and I think, you know, this is what we're all getting to up here today, I know Rashawn is definitely going to touch on this, is also you want as well, and so um, this is what we're up against. And our customers are facing a lot of barriers every day, whether it's um, down payment assistance or whether it's just stable housing in general. You know, am I going to make my next rental payment? And I'll get into some of the things that uh, Kate alluded to with our work with the libraries and, and access to information. So looking ahead, I'm just going to touch briefly on our development at Wolf River, uh, which is where James Road dead ends, or no, McLean Road dead ends into James up at the southern point of Frazier. We have a plan of development up there for 33 single-family homes. Uh, we built 17, and we are going to start building on two more this year. Um, it's been slow going uh, due to a lot of different things, but we're excited about getting building again. 
I'm also going to talk about accessibility uh, when we're talking about building new in the city and infill. Uh, we want to ensure that our homes are at least visible and have some accessibility features because we, I learned earlier last week um, that 80% of fair housing complaints were disability related. Um, so disability and affordability rentals are very hard to come by. Um, and then that, I'll get into some mobile home education and then us getting out and, and taking our, our courses on the road and into libraries. And then I'll end with uh, just a few of what our mortgage products are about. So our homes, this is what they look like here at Wolf River Bluffs. Um, they're fully energy efficient, eco-built uh, homes. Uh, this is a long time coming. We started off, um, these homes were appraising for under 100000 and we couldn't, I mean, if we wanted to do the energy efficiency and really do the vision of green homes, we had to do something. So we talked with the appraisers, we, we tried to get a cost appraisal instead of a comp, and uh, worked really hard, and we ended up doing that, and they started appraising at 129.9. So we we sold to our first homeowners there at 129.9, and now they're appraising at 134.9. So that's good news. It's going up. A lot of places in Frazier are now using uh, values go up, and we're excited to see that. Uh, we do have down payment assistance available uh, for our next two that we're about to build. Um, so uh, the cost to build these are still a little bit higher than that appraisal, uh, uh, just due to all the energy efficiency and features and other things. So um, we will be working with the state on their THDA appraisal gap funding uh, to help us make this whole, but also ensure that those values continue to go up. So uh, we are building six new rental homes that are targeted to uh, veterans, but they are accessible for all. Um, and we're using state funding. These were on lots that were created that once a vacant abandoned property lived on. Uh, we used state funding to demolish that vacant abandoned property, and then we got the housing trust fund to put homes back on those lots. The idea is never to just have a vacant lot. That's not the end goal. The end goal is to build something that is uh, useful, accessible, and um, helpful for the neighborhood. So this design I really like, not just because of the full, fully accessible radius here, I don't know if there's a, any on this, but um, here, these are full, fully accessible turning radiuses, fully accessible shower, um, but what I really like about it is the flow of the house. So even if you are a veteran living with a roommate or you're a mother with a couple of kids, you walk in the door, you have separate entrances to both bedrooms, separate entrances to both bathrooms, you have the closets here, so you have some privacy on either end. So I really like how it flows. Um, there is a place for washer, mechanical, all that stuff. So beyond it being just accessible, it's something I would like to get, a, you know, a design I would like to, to have of getting around in. Um, but these are small footprints, big impact. This is 900 square feet. The, the lots we're building on are small lots. It's uh, one in South Memphis, the Heights, um, Orange Mound and one in the Black Smoky City area. So those are five lots um, and they're small lots and we're going to put this one um, on all of those on the Mississippi lot. There's going to be two, so we can fit two on there. So it's going to be a sort of more of a semi-attached, uh, not necessarily duplex, but kind of. Um, so anyways, we're excited about this. This is a new design and um, I'll just move on to the next thing. Um, so, like Kate said, we've been working a lot with MAR, but also with Building um, Memphis and uh, the Libraries United Way. Uh, one of the things that we talk a lot about is access to good information. Too often, our families come to us, they're already in a predatory uh, loan or payday loan uh, situation, and it's because you know, they, one, may not have ac had access to banking or access to something else, but also misinformation is out there. So we want to be able to get more information, more housing resources for people um, where they are. Uh, and they can't always make it to our office. Transportation is an issue. So we wanted to take our courses, our classes, and our information out into um, the neighborhoods. And so we've, the, Mem the, the branch librarians are super excited. They're passionate about what they do. And so actually Susan Berry, this is the Parkway Village corner. She got out and she made this herself. Uh, our office is over there in Parkway Village, so it's very United Housing centric. But the idea is for every library, no matter where they are, is to be uh, tailored to that neighborhood. So if it's a library in Fraser, I'll have Fraser CDC that has a library in South Memphis, you know, the works will have all of their stuff in there. So it's kind of like tailored to where you are. And I like that because our neighborhoods are unique, their needs are unique. And uh, being able to do that is, is great. And we put on workshops inside the libraries as well. 
Um, this to the left is our workshop that we did in Binghamton. Binghamton invited us, they asked us if, if we could come and, and put on one of our home education classes there. So the Lester Community Center, um, that's where we put that one on. And our next one is April 27th. Saturday at Crosstown Concourse, the Crosstown CDC wanted us to come out and, and work with their neighborhoods around the, the concourse, so we're gonna be doing that on April 27th. So I'm gonna wrap up. Um, this is what we've been up to with our lending. So we've uh, had this Cherry Mortgage product for a little while, but we're ramping it up. Um, it's up to $70,000 sales price. We do ask for a modest down payment from the borrower at 1%. We do have some closing costs available if necessary, but our average payment, is, again, is an affordable payment, um, and we have flexible credit criteria. We do have a number, and that's 580 is the minimum, but we will be really flexible with that, look at what uh, alternative credit lines, um, student debt, these things, we'll take all case by case. Um, <coughs> the next one is our home improvement loan, and this is up to 15,000 to make the necessary repairs to your house. Uh, again, it's a low fixed rate, flexible credit uh, criteria, and a lot of these uh, upgrades will see, you could see increases in property value. If you get your roof done, the, I think there's a 60 to 70% return on investment. Um, a 10% increase in value of new HVAC system is what I've seen. And of course, energy efficiency just adds on to that affordability uh, to, for utility bills to, to be lower. Um, so we're working on this, and you can actually, if you do purchase a home using the Cherry, you can, uh, if the home needs some renovations, we could do something like a 203K and add this, and, uh, as put it in escrow, so you could make those renovations before you get in there. So we're doing a pairing there uh, with that if necessary. The last one is something that's a little bit different, a little bit experimental. Uh, it wasn't, not back in the day, but we are doing up to $70,000 a 10-year term um, where a tax ID number is enough and we'll work with you. Um, and this is something that's been going great. We have, it, the average sales price has been around 45,000. We've lent out 400 so far, um, and most of the payoff in six years. So this is uh, targeted more for undocumented individuals, and um, most recently, somebody paid off their house. She just owns her house out right now, and uh, we've seen the pickup in, this, in the use of this product in the last couple of years. Uh, that is all. Uh, we are excited about get start, getting started on building back on our lots. Um, this was in the Heights neighborhood, and that's Jared with the Heights CDC. And we brought the, the Lester Middle School kids out to, to see the demo go down. But not just to see um, you know, something come down, but that we are going to build something back. And that you know, these kids walk by these homes every day to go to school and have something new that they can go by. They wrote a letter to the veteran, uh, a welcome home letter. Um, that we're going to give them when we're finished building. So we're excited about getting started on these in the next few months. Um, and we'll <laughs> So thank you. Building, capacity building, 
creative placemaking, and community engagement. For our community engagement side, we work with a lot of regional and city municipalities and a lot of their community, their planning and development efforts. And we work to engage the CDCs to also include their residents in a lot of the planning and development process that are happening. Um, we also do civic education where we take a lot of these conversations that are had, um, you know, maybe in government officials' offices or in city council or what's happening on the national landscape of things. And we bring those conversations into the neighborhoods and we really talk about these are the things that are coming down the pipe and these are the resources that you should be aware of and these are the things that you can kind of learn from some of the local champions that are actually addressing these issues on their full-time job and then take them to your neighborhood leaders as a neighborhood toolkit to actually implement in your neighborhood. So sharing your resources. We all have a lot of um, champions that are special, special, that have specialties in their own regards, but sharing that information because the problem is so large that not one person can handle it on their own is one of the ways that we try to do that through um, our civic education side. Um, just recently, we worked with Neighborhood Preservation Inc. last year to launch our community development book club. Community Development Book Club um, has a series of um, one book for two months. We're trying to have a more reading uh, friendly uh, city. Um, and, and it's not that it's just like fun reading stuff. These are hard conversations that you have to tackle. Um, one of the things that I think is most relevant to you, and you guys might consider reading it if you have not already, is The Color of Law, The Forgotten History of Segregated America. Um, by Richard Rothstein. And what he really does in that book, and what we had a conversation in that book club, was really talk about how there have been years and years of systemic policies. Um, a lot of insurance companies, and a lot of you know political officials, all the way from the presidents, all the way to local police, in terms of how they not only interpreted actual acts that gave um, civil rights, but also enforced um, interpretations that prevented a lot of minorities from being able to access. I'm sorry. I can't talk a lot. <laughs> from being able to access opportunities to wealth build. Um, you learn in that book hard lessons that you, you may be of uh, African American or a Hispanic or a minority, and you might actually learn some things that you wish you would have learned at school. And then you might be on the other side of the fence and you might realize, wow, this does exist. And I, you, you, from this book, this, this book is a very important book if you haven't read it. You learn that you know, going through school, um, the school educational system, there are things that you just have to arm yourself with information if you are trying to be intentional and investing in this community and you can't just depend on what's handed to you for free or in the school system, you have to be intentional about educating and arming yourself, what's happening. Um, and then, so we have those conversations in our community development book club. We also encourage CDCs, we also encourage realtors to be a part of this conversation because this book club is not just a, a community development book club where you have the same people who are working full time the same thing. These are normalized conversations that we're having across the table of refreshments with community members. And this is an opportunity for you to educate yourself outside of what you learn from the context of the book, but from hearing from what community members have to say. Because you may come to find out that there might be Susie Q, who, her real name is Susie Q, but she goes by Shaquana, and you may realize that Shaquana made a phone call to a realtor, and the realtor said, I'm sorry, man, but we don't have any properties for you. So without even being seen, there's a lot of things that are going on in her head right now. Wow, does she really not have any properties to show me? Is it because my name? Should I use Susie Q as my name instead of Shaquana? There's a lot of things, even though that you may not be aware of it, which is why I can really and truly appreciate the conversations that we had earlier today. Because you have to be intentional about how you come across whenever you're having any type of interaction. And if you're not being intentional about making sure that you're opening a space for others, you could tend to push people out of that space. And so those conversations are where we kind of have that opening of the eye. And so we encourage you to have it every month. 
Um, uh, I think the next one is April 26th um, at United Way. And that one is The Color of Law. Um, I'm blanking out on the rest of the, uh, the book title, but I can definitely give that to you. Um, Mercedes Baradan, who is actually um, sitting on the front lines of going to a lot of the financial committees to the federal uh, house in particular to make sure that we are actually looking at the way that we re-examine um, the way CRA is being handled. That's another topic um, for another day. Um, but it's, that's, that's one of the ways that we try to also work with uh, civic education. So a lot of the emphasis of the books have been around housing, um, so which is why I thought it was appropriate to bring it up. Another thing that we do on our public policy and advocacy side, which is probably one of the more reasons why I'm here today, um, we have five groups that we focus on on the policy lens. The first one is um, um, transportation and safety, civic, um, transportation and safety, community and economic development, <coughs> light reuse and revitalization, um, neighborhoods and local governments, and most importantly, affordable housing. Our affordable housing, we work, our working group supports the equitable revitalization of Memphis. Um, we want to increase access to housing tools. We want to promote home ownership. We want to protect the rights of renters. And we want to reduce the occurrence of blight-driven housing barriers and advocate for resources that improve um, affordable um, housing options. And so uh, some of the things that we've been doing to kind of push that is having action-based solution conversations around how we bring about these things. Um, some of the things that we've been working on with the city of Memphis and some other CDCs and community-based organizations is working to support um, bringing the Memphis Affordable Housing Trust Fund into fruition. Uh, one of the things that you'll come to realize um, in this space is very quickly that in order to improve the availability of affordable housing, you have to have subsidies. And if you're following the trends, uh, a lot of the federal that was coming down the pipe will know that um, you can't really depend on um, a lot of funding to continue to come down the pipe. The pool of funding is diminishing as we're heading out towards the future. And so how can we bring about a local um, subsidy that can be responsive to the community needs as um, time changes and community needs change? And so um, working with um, on that, there's a minor home repair. There was an interest that has been brought to us from some of the CDCs that they, the city of Memphis used to have a, a program that would support minor home rehab and um, uh, minor home repair. And there's a need to bring it back, but there were a couple of things that we just needed to look into in terms of how can we be a little bit more um, supportive of truly investing and, and offering an opportunity to be able to rehab um, the people that need it the most. Um, we are also challenging um, this question about what affordable housing means. Um, if we were to kind of come up with support, supportive resources to address the need, do we want to just stick um, with um, HUD's definition of affordable housing, or are we interested in opening up, um, opening up resources to be able to support how intentional we are about increasing um, the opportunities for neighborhood revitalization where you're having mixed income um, in neighborhoods. We are also um, working to support um, uh, the establishment of the anti-blight uh, grant program, um, which there's a lot of vacant and abandoned houses throughout all of Memphis. And sometimes if you want to be able to address and develop some of those homes, the cost of actually being able to acquire the, the property and to be able to build that property is is not um, anywhere comparing to the value of the actual property itself. And so um, if this grant comes to fruition, this will be a humongous resource to a lot of nonprofit uh, developers who are looking for something to kind of support um, or make it easier for them to actually acquire and develop those properties. Um, Recently, we have the Housing Counseling Network um, that we just revived a couple of years ago. Um, let me let me preface that Building Memphis. We are in this year. We are celebrating our 20th uh, anniversary, and so um, in, uh, earlier in 2000, uh, we launched the Housing Counseling Network as a way to be able to support 
um, facilitating resources for anybody who was looking to have um, connection to housing resources. And there was a strategy where you would kind of have this one platform. Um, one platform. I, I, I'm so sorry. On um, this one platform. <laughs> Um, we're able to uh, call this number and get out, get um, connected to the right resources um, based on your need. Uh, well, that cost a lot of money because it had a billboard platform, and so we're making uh, do with what we have because what we're <coughs> noticing is, as um, you're looking at the numbers of homeowners to renters, the numbers are totally unproportional from Shelby County to the city of Memphis. Um, we've got a lot more people that are renting compared to homeowners in the Memphis area when you're um, looking at Memphis compared to Shelby County. And then we're also looking at the rates of what rents are and how affordable they are and how um, diminishing the affordable rental uh, opportunities are. And so how can we be able to connect um, these uh, renters um, who are being forced into renting and connect them to resources where they can choose to be renters or choose to be homeowners. And so we came up through the affordable housing policy um, uh, with the idea to resurrect the Housing Counseling Network. Um, the Housing Counseling Network convenes um, housing and financial counselors on a quarterly basis to be able to um, network together, learn together what each other's specialties are, and through the weaknesses and areas that they want to know and become more acquainted with the more resources that exist out there. Um, there are national training that we bring and to also kind of help prepare them for the HUD uh, 2020 changes that are coming down the pipe um, for housing counselors and housing counseling agencies. Um, because the need for access to housing information is becoming more and more relevant, the need to increase the amount of available housing counselors to be able to satisfy that growing need is also becoming even more of a focus of the Housing Counseling Network. So if you know anyone that's interested in becoming a housing counselor, or you're just interested in kind of just introducing yourself and, and showing how you can be a resource or fit into that housing resource ecosystem, please come see me. We're happy to bring you in on board. Um, but this is our way to be able to kind of um, satisfy increasing or satisfying the need for accessing housing information. I think that's enough. I don't know how much time I have left. <laughs> um, good morning. <laughs> I'm Roshan Austin, I'm the president of the Works Incorporated. Uh, we're a 21-year-old, well, soon to be 21-year-old community development corporation. And I said to the staff at the this morning, we probably should change our banner not to just say serving South Memphis, because I'm about to tell you that we don't just serve South Memphis in our description of our organization. Uh, we were founded to serve the companies and needs of children and families in South Memphis. And just to give you an idea of what I mean by companies and needs, we're the developers of multifamily and single-family housing, uh, with the multifamily being for very and extremely low-income families by HUD's definition. So people that are living 60% below the median, 50% below the median, 30% below the median. Um, and we develop single-family housing similar to United Housing. And um, we, we did a lot of housing counseling. We do more now. Uh, in connection with our mortgage loan fund, which I'll talk about last because that's what I'm going to talk about today. We um, established uh, the South Memphis Farmers Market, so we operate an outdoor market. We had a small grocery store um, called The Grocer at the South Memphis Farmers Market. We operate cooking matters in our kitchen at the South Memphis Farmers Market. We tend to like that. We just keep South Memphis Farmers Market going in all of our program areas. Um, we do a lot of work in South Memphis uh, on a national initiative called the Big Jump. Um, we do a lot of places, and I'll talk, the Big Jump is a cycling and pedestrian uh, initiative, mostly around cycling, uh, done by people for bikes to increase those amenities in the neighborhood and, and to increase the culture of cycling, mostly because of uh, transportation needs. About one third of our residents in South Memphis do not, not own automobiles, but we're about two miles south of the center of downtown. It takes an hour and a half on a bus because of the transfer uh, to get anywhere. So we're a desert for food, obviously, because I keep mentioning food uh, projects. We also operate a, um, a loan fund, uh, the Healthy Food Financing Initiative Fund, 
and we've loaned out about 1.6 million to an independent grocery store um, for two stores, the Cash Saver brand, uh, the Capital Retail Group is the owner of the uh, stores, really. But the, both the Elvis Presley store and this recently the reopening of the uh, Southgate store that was once formerly covered that closed um, at the last minute. Last February, maybe Corbin, maybe the rest of us did not. And so we reopened that as a cash saver in August of last year. Um, and so we have a long term partnership with the Castle Retail Group, which is a supplier of our small corner, si corner store size uh, store in South Memphis with grocery store prices. So we have the prices of the cash saver who are just the size of a corner store. Um, we are the sponsor of the first independent uh, elementary charter school in Tennessee, Circle of Success Learning Academy. Uh, we have uh, 240 in our charter, 8 through 5. Uh, it's right, housed right across the street from us in our affiliated organization, St. Andrew African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, our organization was founded by the former pastor, Dr. Kenneth Robinson, uh, to address housing needs, but we went astray. Uh, and we do a lot of stuff uh, because we recognize that we could not just deal with the housing needs of families. We needed to deal with all of their needs uh, around food and transportation. Uh, and we do some work uh, in connection with our partner, Neighborhood Preservation Inc., around the public space and green space. We do lots and lots of community engagement uh, work because uh, our work only means something if it means something to the neighborhood and they need to define what that looks like and what the priorities are. We're just the stewards of their of their plan, uh, which we operate under a plan, uh, the South Memphis Revitalization Action Plan. Uh, we garnered about half a million dollars in support for that plan. For the two, a thousand unique residents participated in that plan uh, 11 years ago, which we are continuing on with many work because we feel the plan is stale, and so we need to make updates to make sure that the priorities that were set 11 years ago are still true today. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is our mortgage loan fund. So we're lenders, and I always, I, I go by my title, and Amy's title is president also. Our legal titles are president of uh, our community well, development corporation. But often people don't think of nonprofits as corporations. We're corporations, uh, small um, employers and corporations with a status that's charitable. So we have a mission-driven status. And the one thing that we don't pay in taxes is the federal business tax. We do pay payroll taxes, property taxes in Tennessee. Uh, and, 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 and we're complex organizations. And I like to let people know that we're probably more com complex than a typical corporation. And I'll give you an idea of the complexity. I'm not only the president of the Works Incorporation. I'm the president of about six for-profit entities that we have to form when we do multi-family properties. So I'm the president of Alpha Renaissance Limited Partnership, Alpha Renaissance Apartments, Inc., uh, and Renaissance Works Limited Liability Corporation, Alpha Renaissance Limited Liability Corporation, just it goes on. And so we're very complex because of the IRS code in Section 42. It requires that we form separate entities uh, to operate in, particularly in a multi-family world. And so I'm signing my life away every day. Uh, our operating budget, just to give people an idea, because people call us and they think like we're free organizations that are not skilled and don't know what we're doing. Our operating budget is around $6 million, and it's just operations. And um, one project budget of a multi-family deal is $16 million. And so that does not include our multiple hands and everything. And I forgot we operate modern home repair, which is huge. So we do modern home repair uh, for existing homeowners in the South City area, uh, and um, where we do up to $15,000 in exterior repairs, and that is a grant program. Uh, so it's recoverable. And so we want the homeowners to stay in their home and not take the windfall of the equity we've invested and leave and sell. Uh, we also operate a minor home repair program for homeowners in the Klondike Smoky City area in partnership with a smaller CDC, the Klondike Smoky City CDC. Uh, and that's up to $20,000 in interior and exterior repairs and that separation in South City in order to serve families who were not low income. HUD has these weird rules and so we needed to stay outside 
because the moment we go inside, it triggers income eligibility. And so we would not be able to serve families that were moderate or higher income, but still could not make $15,000 in repairs on their homes. And a part of the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative with uh, the City of Memphis, MHA, and HUD uh, wants to address not just the residents of former residents of public housing, but the entire neighborhood. And so you'll see something different in South City than you saw in the previous um, Hope Six program, which was done in Uptown Lemoyne, formerly Lemoyne Gardens, which is College Park, and I forget all of the different names. It's, yeah, College Park and Uptown. I think those are the <laughs> uh, So the revamping of what was formerly public housing. And so I want to talk about our mortgage loan fund. And I don't take the credit for this coming, this happening. I have to give a lot of the credit to the policy conversations that came out of Building Memphis. And it, it took me a while to start saying Building Memphis because in 1999, I was the first chair of what was formerly called the Community Development Council when we decided to incorporate uh, and become a real professional organization, and not just a loose group of people hanging out together. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, the Opportunity Home Loan Fund um, is our small dollar mortgage fund. And so it came about in some conversations that Building Memphis and its partners were having, including its financial institution partners, were having around what was happening in Memphis neighborhoods, uh, particularly those that have seen decline over the last few decades. Um, what we were finding was that we were not able to, although we may have been spending 120000 to build new homes or renovate new homes, we were only able to get appraisals around fifty in lower. Uh, so we had this huge gap, uh, which we used a lot of federal entitlement subsidy in order to build anything. And so you saw community development corporations not able to build a lot. Uh, and, and because we're not 100% grant funded, and we were taking out lines of credit from banks. So we have banker friends. I saw my, the first person I saw this morning was Keith Turbin um, <laughs> from First Tennessee. And so we know a lot of financial institution friends. And then I saw Brophy. So, um, so that, that conversation led to the creation. But it took many, many years. So this conversation has been going on probably 20 years because that's been true or more than 20 years, because I've been in the industry for more than 20 years, and when you said United Housing was 25 years old, I was an intern there around the time uh, when it first started. Um, and so we've been having this conversation that entire time, uh, that we needed a product um, to fit uh, the needs of consumers who wanted to live in neighborhoods. And so a lot of the work I mentioned before about placemaking and um, food access and cycling and uh, green space is important because those neighborhoods are full of assets and we want people to be encouraged to uh, live in neighborhoods in, within the loop in the city that have seen decline and have been disinvested. Um, and I like to say Memphis grew up to be a suburb because we talk about the pocket corridor and I, I, at this point in my life I like to see Memphis grow up to be a city. Uh, and so that means um, walkable neighborhoods that are dense. Uh, it means a lot of things depending on what you think about cities. Uh, but when I look at the biggest cities and the ones we think most about, we think about New York, you can walk New York. I know that if I walk a block, I walk the tenth of a mile in New York. And I spend most of my time in New York either on public transportation or walking. If I think about San Francisco, it's uh, seven by seven, it's only 49 square miles where Memphis is 340 or whatever it is, 325, 40 square miles, something, over 300 square miles. So it's a lot bigger than San Francisco or New York. And we can, we're cities combined. And so we've taken up all of the farmland that we need to take up and we need to reinvest in our city and increase our taxes. And so the loan fund is not just about whether we're getting people um, randomly back into neighborhoods, but it's, a, it's, I always tell my individual borrowers that it's not about your individual home ownership, it's about a collective investment back into our community. Um, and so the Opportunity Home Loan Fund was created to assist low and moderate income families to become first time home buyers and targeted zip codes, and I probably need to change that because it still assists any family, and so we don't have income limits. For those families, we like to encourage people to live in targeted zip codes where we've seen disinvestment. Um, and 
uniquely, our bank partner, one of our bank partners came to the works. <laughs> we didn't actually seek out this program. So my in my early years after United Housing Internship, I became the president of the Orange Mound Development Corporation, and I did that for about 10 years. And I was, I, I was pre, um, recruited away by the mortgage industry. And so eight years, I worked at a corporation that does not exist anymore called GMAC Mortgage uh, and Homecomings, uh, which was filed bankruptcy, they filed bankruptcy, ally, financial file bankruptcy after I left. Uh, <laughs> and so in that eight years, I um, did, I was a, a broker originator in nine states because I had to pass the national exam, so I had an NMLS number like uh, other people. Uh, I didn't keep up with that after I came back to the nonprofit world. So I was uniquely positioned having done some origination and counseling work on the nonprofit side, but also had, I did eight years of foreclosure prevention uh, in this market. And so I wanted a product um, that matched my experiences uh, and fit the needs of borrowers. And so we targeted zip codes based on where we had lower prices. And so those are South Memphis, Orange Mound, North Memphis, Frazier, the Heights, Binghamton area. Not all of Binghamton, but part of Binghamton. And so the, the loans are for homes that are 50,000 and lower. Uh, they can be appraised for more. The sales price has to be 50,000 or lower. Um, and so we created, we didn't really create, so <laughs> we call it social underwriting versus traditional lending, which looks at the FICO score. And so we tell borrowers or potential borrowers that we are not looking at your FICO. And that was important to me because what we found among low-income borrowers <coughs> often, uh, back in the day when banks were not bought out by bigger banks and they had portfolio products, uh, they would look at non-traditional uh, lines of credit like their rental history or telephone or cable bill. Uh, utility history. Um, and so we wanted to um, take advantage of that old portfolio product um, work because we found low income borrowers often live cash on a cash basis and they did not establish credit because they don't have banks in their deserts for institutions, financial institutions also. And so they don't have traditional lenders there. And so they can't access credit because they don't have credit, so they don't have a score. So it was kind of catch-22. And so we didn't want to exclude those borrowers uh, from uh, being able to borrow and live in neighborhoods where they were already living and paying rent. Um, and so we look at credit behavior. And so I also did foreclosure prevention, so I'm forgiving. Uh, and we always say we extend grace. And banks often have these long periods of time, 24 months, um, 18 months, where if you've had something to happen to you, you fell ill and you were not able to work or you were laid off for two weeks. And I saw people across the income spectrum who two weeks were in foreclosure because of two weeks. And so I knew it was important that we extended grace. And so we're looking at their credit behavior. How have they paid if they don't have credit? How have they paid the rent? Um, how have they paid their utility bill with MLGW? How they paid uh, telephone, they don't have outstanding collections and judgments. And if they had collections, because we understand things happen, have you made attempts to repay that over a period of time? And we don't force you into 24 months of repayment or paying it completely off, but we need to see <coughs> some repayment history of that. And I, and I, I, I can get fussy with borrowers. I'm like, uh, one lady, one of our early borrowers, had $300 on her credit card she had just gotten. And it was January when she came to see me, or February, and it was still in I said, what did you do with the 300 She said, I bought my three-year-old grandchild something for Christmas. I said, you could have given your three-year-old grandchild a box. Because <laughs> yeah. um, I'm sure they did not pay, play with that, whatever you bought them for $300 longer than they played with the box. And so, I, you know, I'd like to, be real with people and, and, and say, hey, don't make those type of credit decisions. And a lot of people are not trained. Uh, you know, it was Leslie and I. I'm sorry, who did I talk to? Leslie and I were talking about, because we were on a panel, we had one panel last night, um, we do panels a lot, uh, <laughs> uh, talking about ed the education piece. 
and how important that is because we can't assume that everyone gets that. And I found that out in foreclosure prevention. It does not matter income. <laughs> Some families don't pass along. We talk about generational wealth, but they don't pass along the generational knowledge. And so we do look at some things that lenders look at. We do look at the ratios, but their ratios are based on gross. And so we do walk through that with our potential borrowers. But foreclosure prevention comes back up. I look at take home pay, uh, minus none debt household expenses to determine what support is really affordable for a borrower. And we leave them at 10% surplus um, in the event that they have an automobile um, charge or cost that they didn't expect, like a tire. We don't want them going into foreclosure over a tire. Um, and so credit uh, behavior. Credit is simple. The ability of a customer to obtain goods or services based on trust that the payment will be made in the future. Uh, Credit behavior opens the door for those who have decided against establishing revolving installment accounts, but have a good payment history with payment of non-debt accounts. The delinquencies require an explanation, and so I spent we spent a lot of time. And I can't say I anymore because I have a new mortgage program manager, woo, from Pinnacle. <laughs> well, actually, I don't know if I mentioned that Pinnacle was the bank that approached us about uh, operating this small dollar uh, loan fund, and they invested. Um, they made the first investment into our loan fund of now $700,000 uh, for us to start using community investment tax credit from THDA, uh, where banks can make an investment or lend to us at prime minus four. So depending on prime, it could be zero. Uh, and we come to some kind of agreement after seven years to fully amortize our loan, or they could just give it to us, which would be great uh, <laughs> over time. Uh, so, and I'm convincing them they're going to give it to us after that seven years, and we we will collect. And they actually service those loans on our behalf because we don't have a servicing shop. Um, they collect our payments. Um, so delinquencies do require an explanation. And I ask, you know, I used to have people tell me they'd be 18 months behind in their mortgage, and I'd say, so what happened? And they say I was laid off. Um, for two weeks or a month. And I'm like, 18 months later, uh, what happened? <laughs> I'm missing something. Or you didn't tell me every, your whole story. I need the entire story. Because one month does not account for 18. Now, maybe it counts for three or four, but I'm not going to give you 18. Something else happened. And so, I mean, we had all kinds of discoveries. People had gambling problems. You know, so I send them to a gambling hot hotline or they did tell me the whole story, they had cancer, or and, you know, I was crying a lot, they had, I had a lot of sad stories. Um, but that last one says, we don't forget the business. And so we do forgive um, people, we don't keep it, hold it against them for the rest of their lives because something happened to them. Um, and I always tell people, I like to say this because there's this trend, I don't know, it's not just happening around credit repair. So we have customers who come to us, and I say beware of credit repair because the title research is not as forgiving. Um, and so they come to us with these high scores because they've gone to credit repair people, but I had a woman who had, she was in the 70s. Um, and so we just went off the credit uh, report and we approved her. We got to the title research and she, had, someone had bought a ring, but it was in her name some years ago from a jewelry store. And so I was asked, I don't assume that it's true. I said, did you have a ring? Well, number one, is this your name? <laughs> Social security number, your middle initial. Did you ever have a ring from this store or some jewelry from this store? And she was like, yeah, but I didn't get married. And I'm like, but you had the ring. I'm sorry that your relationship didn't work out. And so well, we need to make some arrangements with this jewelry store or we can't close on this loan because we can't have this drawer place a lien ahead of our mortgage uh, to collect on a ring in a relationship that ended. Uh, so uh, people don't understand that, that it may not appear on the credit report, but the title research has a way of finding it. And they think that the title research is just about the property and about the seller, but it's also about the borrower. It's tiny, and so I've kind of talked about what I'm not going to uh, make you read all of that. 
Uh, so we don't, judgments need to be paid in full. We accept federal arrangements uh, on collections. We cannot have any delinquency on federal debt because we're not going up against the IRS. We just not, or the US Department of Education. Those are two groups that we're not messing with. Uh, we, with bankruptcies, uh, we'd like to see two years after this charge day. We're flexible on that because we do have a borrower who was in an active Chapter 13 who had paid on time for two and a half years in her Chapter 13. So and the trustee did give her permission to borrow uh, from us. And she has a very low payment, and you will see how low our payments are. And I think Amy showed some of those payments uh, happening. But at Chapter 7, I can't see, we can't see dismissed. We need to understand what happened. Uh, we need to see discharged. Um, and we need to see that the overhaul pattern of credit behavior um, is pretty good. So, reviewing the basics, we look at the income and the source. Uh, it can be from um, a federal source like Social Security benefits um, or retirement. We had a Vietnam vet who um, had never owned a home. So his income was his retirement from uh, the military and his social security benefits, and it was enough for him uh, to afford uh, a house and have a surplus, because we always need the surplus. Uh, we look at what's really affordable. Remember, I look at the net, uh, less the food, and so we go over your budget. We ask about your how much you eat, and I have families that come in and they're trying to trick me, and they say, my family of five eats $100 a month. <laughs> 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 That's my family small eat about 600 a month. You apparently don't eat anything or you farm. And you just not tell me it's the best And so I make people be honest with you. Be like, you're not just eating 100. Or we have a family that comes in with kids and say, you say, so how much do you spend on going out, movies, Netflix? Uh, and because I know how kids are, and I have because I have a teenager. Um, and they say, well, I don't spend anything on going out. I'm like, really? <laughs> or eating out. And I say, and I used to say with poor post let me see your bank statements. And they're like, well, I don't eat out. And I go down, it's $200 a week in Burger King. I'm like, you need Burger King in your house? <laughs> it's like, wow, I didn't know they made those kind of arrangements. And so they do eat out. They don't consider fast food eating out because they're not sitting down necessarily, but it's eating out. It's not your kitchen. Uh, and so we really go in detail in that budget. And I look at the family size. I don't even expect the family of one to go to the grocery store and eat $100 worth. Because I, I want to know what grocery store they shop at. Even cash savers right. not that low cost. Um, and so no of open judgments or collections without arrangements. And it's, of course, it's not about the score. Um, I wanted to tell a story uh, with our small adult mortgage loan fund that, you know, to banks that, hey, take a chance on families who you would not take a chance on uh, with your products. We wanted to prove that they perform as well or better than borrowers who obtain mortgages from traditional financial institutions. And so we have no EPDs, and that's my servicing side. An early payment default is a loan that experiences a 90-day delinquency for the first 12 months. We don't have any of those. Uh, our average loan-to-value ratio is 78% uh, because it's not just about getting people into homes, but it's about really creating growth uh, in home ownership. And so we don't want to put people at 100% on the value, 97% on the value, um, because they end up upside down. And I, I, I'm blunt. And so I get in trouble sometimes. I was asked to come to a housing uh, policy panel with U.S. Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren when she was here uh, about a month ago. And I don't know why they asked me to come. Uh, because she said one thing at the table, she said that African Americans uh, have experienced wealth creation with home ownership. And Rashawn 
I, I did a microaggression. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, so let's take that lie off the table. Because what we found is that's not true. Over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, every study has shown that that's not true because African-Americans tend to have no generational wealth, and so they don't bring 20% to the table uh, with products that we had uh, before. I went into foreclosure prevention with 110% LTV and the uh, stated income loans. We found that that can't be true. They're going upside down. Um, and so, and then in Memphis alone, and I'm sure Austin probably will mention this, we've seen an 18% drop in uh, home ownership uh, among African-Americans. And so we knew that that wasn't true. And so we really wanted to create wealth. And so it's important that people enter home ownership in an equity position. And so our average on the value ratio is 78%. We've had people going as low as 62% because we were able to put uh, programs together, an individual development account, they were an employer of our partner organization. So they, one guy, he had um, a $35,000 loan and he had $11,000 from his employer. So he went in at twenty-four thousand, uh, and the house was for forty-five. So he entered his home in an equity position, um, and so our average total mortgage payment of all the loans we made is three hundred eighty-four dollars. And I think that's a little high because uh, we keep running line around insurance, and so some of the insurance premiums are uh, high, and we don't know the formula that they use, so we can't even really go after the insurance companies. Um, we pick on the banks a lot. We should be picking on the insurers. Amen. Um, Amen. We just don't know how to do it because they confuse us. <laughs> <laughs> and so, 40% of our loans have been made in South Memphis, 52% in Frazier. Orange Man and the Heights account for 8%. Um, six of the 21 long, 21, six of the 21 months in service, and while we've been servicing loans, no, no borrowers fell 30 days or more time. Um, and we've not had a borrower fall more than 60 days behind on the mortgage. Oh. And so uh, the mortgage delinquency rates, I just wanted to look at this. You see blue, that's the current. And we've had a few borrowers that fall uh, 30. And a couple, one lady fought, fell 60, and she's paid off her loan. She paid off her loan in less than a year. She came into uh, a windfall, and we have no prepayment penalties. Uh, so you can pay off your loan early. It's not our goal to collect interest over time. I mean, we love paying for interest payments, but we're not trying to run our business based on interest over 30 years. Our, our loans are not 30 year loans, they're 20 year loans. So we didn't do the 15, we didn't do the 30. We fell in between because it might be different. Uh, <laughs> and so we, we just stopped at 20. Uh, but I mentioned our mortgage program manager, and I'm proud to have recruited her away from clinical financial partners. Uh, it's been over 35, 40 years in the mortgage banking uh, experience. And so Gary Woods one at our table in the back. Um, and she recently started with us, and so now we're going to get a month ago, and we're happy to have her bring her vast experience in mortgage banking to the works. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rashawn's always a tough ass to follow. Right? <laughs> <laughs> when I say this, I'm going to I just want to thank you real quick um, to Kate and Mark for uh, organizing this very, very powerful and necessary conversation. Um, so I'm going to go late days in here. I was just hanging out in the lobby. I thought I had all this time. So, turns out the issue could be up here. Uh, but my name is Austin Harrison. Uh, I work uh, for Neighborhood Preservation Inc. Uh, a couple of our partners have mentioned a um, little about that. Uh, so we are a, a policy advocacy organization. If, if likely you've heard of us before, you, you probably have ran into Steve Barlow uh, around Memphis. Uh, he's a long-time attorney um, for community development. And um, really, uh, other than that, uh, the MPI intentionally uh, maintains a pretty low profile. Um, we're, we're a systemic change organization. So if um, Memphis Area Association of Realtors is succeeding, if United Housing is succeeding, if the works are succeeding, if different CDCs are succeeding, MPI is succeeding. So we partner and we collaborate often, and we radically try to, to shun credit, because it's, it's a system that we're up against. And if the actors that have been within the system for 20 plus years are doing well, then, then we're doing well. 
And so, so really, who we say we work with is anybody, um, really, these are the three ways. We're trying out this new way to explain what we do here. So these, are, these are the three ways. So I want you to envision over each of these boxes uh, are three letters, so three letter acronyms. So you have in. So really, anyone who cares about neighborhoods, that, that's, that's the community wide effort. So any, anybody, private, public, governmental, non governmental, quasi governmental, doesn't matter. Uh, if you care about neighborhoods, care about improving those neighborhoods, then, then you're in our community-wide effort. Uh, the P is policy. So we're, we're trying to advocate the systems. Leslie talked a little about uh, some of our policy priorities. Uh, really, some of our big wins recently is we've uh, radically amended the Neighborhood Preservation Act to make it now where we go after these problem properties. We're um, suing in rem versus in personum, so we're going after the property. So we're not playing a big game of hide and go seek anymore. We're noticing the property we're abating the nuisance as quickly as possible uh, through the Neighborhood Preservation Act, our environmental court under Judge Patrick Anchorage. Another policy uh, that just recently passed the city council in December is uh, Memphis now has an updated housing property code. We have the International Property Maintenance Code. First time we've rewritten that in over 30 years. Um, and so that's, that's gonna totally fundamentally change the systems around code enforcement and uh, property maintenance in neighborhoods. Um, so those are just a couple examples of some of the policy work we've done. And then the final letter, so you got N, you got P, and then our final one is innovation. So as we're changing the system, we have to come alongside organizations and, and figure out how we're gonna act in this. We gotta implement policies, we have to, to try new things. So uh, Rashan mentioned this, this some of their uh, vacant lot reuse. We decided, you know what, we can't make 30,000 um, community gardens, that's how many vacant lots we have. Why don't we start planting some trees and turn them into parks and create spaces that these neighborhoods so desperately needed? So Rashan was like, I got you. I got vacant lots for days. Come on, come on down to South Memphis <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll do some green spaces. And our team really just came and ran with that. Um, and so, so that's really how, how we act. You know, we, we're an organization that is really created to come alongside the government, come alongside community-based organizations, and give them the tools and resources to succeed. And so really what I'm here to talk to you today is mainly about this map that uh, Amy mentioned briefly. So one of the main ways we come alongside organizations is information and data. So in NPI, uh, what I do is I manage the Memphis Property Hub, which is an open data portal that aggregates um, public data. Then I also manage our uh, policy research. Um, sort of, we're doing like applicable policy briefs. Uh, we just had our first one come out last month, but we're really sort of thinking about, you know, on the spectrum of policy, we want to think about new ideas. What Rashan's doing with the social underwriting. How can we look at a policy process that can scale that up? I mean, just, just sort of thinking big picture about the systems around Memphis that, that have uh, made our neighborhoods the way they are. And so one, one we're working on right now, our, our next one is probably going to be around uh, redlining and frankly just quantitatively proving what we are, which is that redlining, while the SNAP is no longer uh, dictating bank lending decisions, it still has cast a uh, really a legacy of disinvestment um, in so many of these neighborhoods that you see in the red, uh, in North Memphis and South Memphis. Um, and so now, what, what, can we, what can we really do about it? Yeah. And, and you've heard some ideas on, on what we can do about that on the panel already. Um, but, but what this has happened is, we've, as we've dug deeper into this, so this is from uh, the Matthews Inequality, uh, is the name of the group at the University of Richmond. They've been digitizing these maps, uh, the National American Archives in DC. And what we've done is we've already sort of made this, what we call in the geospatial world, you know, we geocoded this map. So we're in the process of uh, making this publicly available so uh, Memphians can interact with the information and see what uh, see what we again what we intuitively already knew, but quantitatively take take emotion out of it and see uh, on, in the map what these neighborhoods look like today, I mean, where you see concentrated um, health inequalities, where you see lower uh, life expectancy, uh, where you see the concentration of the 13,000 vacant and abandoned properties we have in Memphis. They're probably going to be in those red areas you know, where you see lack of green space. So, so we're really just trying um, to, to bring the data and the research and the information to the table and to have really uh, honest conversations um, with both, with all, all, all the groups that are involved in this. And I think, I think Mara plays a, a huge role in, in, in overturning um, some of these systems and, and being the change we want to see in our neighborhoods. 
Um, and so that's that's really what we're trying to do with that. And we'll have a we'll have a more detailed uh, more detailed data and more detailed policy brief to come. Uh, but I also wanted to mention the, the vehicle we use for that. I uh, go into a little more detail about this. Um, so out of our uh, our sort of primary uh, program around community uh, wide effort is called the Blight Elimination Steering Team. Um, so Mar has since representatives from the Blight Committee have, have been coming for uh, a couple of years now. We've been uh, doing these meetings uh, for two or three years, and, uh, and so this is a monthly meeting for anyone who is interested in uh, eliminating uh, property blight and revitalizing neighborhoods in Memphis. So we, uh, that's really our key convening. And out of that group came um, this open community data portal. We were tired, like, like many Indians are, of having to go to county assessor for one thing and go to the register of deeds for the other and um, go, go to this website for that. And, and we really just tried to, to bring it all together um, in, in one single source. And, and so it includes over 15 local data sources, including MLGW um, data, including uh, City of Memphis 311 service requests, code enforcement. Um, we really try to bring it all together to give community uh, development corporations and community-based organizations and leaders the full picture of their neighborhood so that they can target their small dollar mortgage program, they can target their big lot remediation programs. You know, we really um, want to give to equip our groups with, with the tools they need to, to fight for their neighborhoods. Um, and so this is going to be where uh, the, the geocoded redlining information lives. If anyone's uh, more interested in talking about that, uh, I'll share my contact information with Kate. We love, uh, we're, we're thinking about a lot of different ways um, we can uh, situate this, this redlining conversation um, because it's so important to Memphis and it's so important to where we've been and for certain where we're going and how we can uh, operate within that reality. I think that's all I had for you. So I'll uh, turn it back over to Jake. Thank you. Thank you guys. Does anybody have any questions? I know I'm visiting, but this is so intriguing. On the Memphis Property Hub, was that funded by a grant? How did you how did you um, finance creating that database? Yeah, so there were three organizations that have been working on it, really financed by two. Uh, so Innovate Memphis, who is uh, the, the Bloomberg financial piece of the mayor's innovation cities in cities all across the country. Uh, Memphis is uniquely the only one that um, has, has sort of a small market. They made it a standalone 501c3. Um, and so they've been able, uh, Innovate Memphis has been able to um, fund things like this and, and be more flexible um, in, in how they innovated within the city services within the city, city hall and, and different uh, programs. And then uh, Neighborhood Preservation Inc. also has funded um, some of this as well. And, and the, main, the main thing it hasn't been, so we really, the infrastructure of the database itself was built on the University of Memphis servers, and so that's really helped cut a lot of costs. Um, and, and so we, we partnered with the University of Memphis and mainly the Center of Applied Earth Science and Engineering Research. Uh, Caesar for sure. Um, and so those three entities have, have made this possible. And it's really beginning to leverage a larger conversation about how we can just talk about open data and transparent government, period. Um, and so we're using, we mainly were interested just in learning about the property information and, and the, the, the white problem, frankly, in the, in the wake of the foreclosure crisis. But it's really now started what can we know about? Have we started sharing more health information? I just start sharing more information. So let's do let's just start. I mean, in this day and age, there's no information. Uh, paper files for court cases isn't going to cut it anymore. You know, how can we start just having these conversations and thinking about um, all Memphians deserve all the information about the public and what they're doing and how they're impacting them. And, and so that, those, that partnership is really leveraged a larger conversation that we're having. We hosted our first civic data forum uh, last month where we convened um, multiple different data providers uh, to, to sort of start thinking bigger about that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
early about insurance. And I find that to be a real problem in those zip codes that you mentioned. I worked on uh, find affordable insurance. I think people being penalized. Mm -hmm. They want to be homeowners, but that becomes a part of being affordable, the insurance rates. And they're out of control in those areas. Yeah. We have got to find, like we did with banking, we've got to find some solutions for that. Well, we're counting on Austin to find <laughs> to find a, I, I don't know if the insurance uh, industry ever created a map. So in the 1930s, the mortgage industry did create a map of rate lining because they thought that was okay. I, I don't think the insurance industry has done that because you know it's important when we talk about insurance in our counseling, we tell borrowers that um, they need you know at least three components. They need the replacement, um, the contents, and liability. Uh, and we break it down so they understand each one of those. And what we find is homeowners that already exist in those areas, they, they don't have policies, they have exclusions right. on their policies that we'll replace everything but the roof. Like, oh, we'll replace the roof. <laughs> the whole house is gone. Or we're, we're not gonna take care of your contents. Or if someone falls on your property, you're liable. We're not gonna ensure that. And so they find ways to get around and it's more expensive. Right. And so we're finding that we have borrowers who are buying these $40,000 or $50,000 dollar properties with insurance, it looks like it should be on a half million dollar house, right. the cost. And so um, they, I don't, I mean, I just don't know how to get at the insurance industry. I am talking to the National, I'm sorry, National Fair Housing, <laughs> yeah, so they bring lawsuits against banks. And, uh, and for, for housing alliance. And so they bring lawsuits against banks. And so when they came to Memphis, and I've had several conversations with their New York attorneys and their DC attorneys around the insurers, um, because um, we, we know about banks get, being placed under consent order for uh, their practices, we need to do the same thing with insurance companies. And I'm counting on their attorneys and their policy people to figure out how we do that, because it's, it's too big of a task for me to even understand. We could probably create a map of that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Um, this question, I guess, will be uh, more direct to Sean, because uh, the work with the CEC. Um, I know Austin, I mean, um, yeah, Austin alluded to it earlier about the, the legislation that they've done with the Neighborhood Protection Act. What have you been in the process of receivership, and have, how does that process look? Uh, it doesn't look like you. So I haven't, and I was asking Amy, has she done uh, receive? I've been, if there's been a request for us to be a receiver. Uh, actually, we may be receiving one soon. Austin probably can talk more about receivership on the Neighborhood Preservation Act uh, because you work, you all have worked with groups that have acted as receivers. Yeah, yeah. So we're, um, so we're actually, you know, I mentioned all the policy implementation side. That's really something uh, we're trying to figure out. So we've actually been having some conversations. Uh, there's a group out of California so it's called the California Receivers Group, a guy named Mark Adams, um, who's really sort of scaled that up. Uh, right now, I think in Memphis, there have only been a few, there are a handful of, of people that, organizations that have uh, been, been receivers um, because up until the three amendments to the Neighborhood Preservation Act last year, uh, they were really limited um, to, to who could do it and, and how they could do it, and we were really sort of broaden that um, in the recent. Uh, so um, I think uh, right now, uh, the, the law school clinic um, I, I push and touch. Denny Shafson and Brittany Williams are in the process of uh, accepting, I think, some of our first receivers in the new amendment. Uh, let's see how we speak. Uh, so I think we're, we don't have a, a complete answer because we're because all I can tell you is how it used to be, and how it used to be was not good, and, and, that, and that's why we changed it. <laughs> and, and so in the change system, um, we're still kind of fi figuring out uh, what, what that can look like and how we can make it. We're really modeling it a lot after. Um, California, but also Baltimore. Baltimore, Maryland has a really good receivers program called One House at a Time. 
if you want to uh, just look them up on, on the website. Um, and they've, they've done, they say one house at a time, but they've scaled up to where they're doing receivers auctions with 50 or 60 properties, and they're, and they're really regenerating the market, and, and they're seeing activity in a lot of these historically <coughs> disinvested areas through, through the receivership process. So it's coming soon in Memphis, but that definitely stay tuned. He'll be running from it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying that. I'm not going to be like anything. I mean, because the law school, the law clinic does, and they contact me. Brittany Williams is the vice chair of my board. And every time she calls us, no. <laughs> because it, it's been all over the court. I don't know. That's the reason I wanted it. And it, you know, I'm finding that more, uh, I guess, nonprofits and CCs are, because it's eligible to people that are neighbors in those areas and those neighborhoods to do it. But it'll probably end up being. <laughs> So, so it, it was it was under the, the previous uh, ordinance. It was just five one c threes, but it's out. It's now actually brought in who can be a receiver. So, so that that's that's one of the big changes we made. Kind of recently. Yeah, I want to say thank you guys for being here. Um, right here. Um, also, <laughs> have a question for you guys: What besides educating our buyers about the options that you guys have presented today, and besides clearly not steering, and we all know that it's and that's not something we're supposed to be doing. Besides those two things, what else can we as realtors do to help what you guys are doing? Uh, one of the things that uh, a lot of our realtor partners already do is, is come in and speak to our homeowner education course. Uh, they come out and talk about how to work with a realtor. That is a safe and neutral space. So you're not supposed to be marketing yourself, but you do go in and you talk with our customers about um, you know, what to look for in the house, uh, how to work with the realtor and all that. And um, so that's one thing you can come out and, and talk to our class. And then another thing is, as we build out the housing corners and the libraries and, and put resources in those physical spaces, uh, going out and, and having a uh, talk with your real, local realtor day or something, uh, volunteering with us and we do workshops out out in the, in the libraries or in the community centers and um, supporting, you know, even at small amounts of lunch or something for one of the workshops or whatever. Um, I know that MAR has been a great supporter of some of our community painters. Um, so just being a, a volunteer partner, um, sharing your knowledge and your information um, and uh, with our customers because it's, it's all about getting good information out there. I just wanted to say to Farah, our Community Development Committee is working with Amy at United Housing. They're going to be putting on a half-day home buyers education class here at MAR for our realtor members so that you guys will all be then able to go to their classes and be that representative. Um, and so we are working on programs. So I would say we welcome the opportunity to kind of help and join us and worry um, on some issues on the policy level here at Building Memphis. Um, I'd also say um, as we are increasing in technology that you be kind of conscious of over-reliance upon big data and algorithms to kind of shape who you reach out to and who you engage to. Um, it's becoming a, a larger concern, at least on a national scale. I know Facebook has made some changes. Uh, being careful and who you market particular opportunities to based on sex, race, or religion. Um, because what you might be able to do is use data that is not necessarily like the most realistic data. Um, and someone might have put this down on an opportunity because of those data and algorithm, algorithms you use to associate with that opportunity. So just be mindful, do your due diligence, and be intentional about how you engage others. Um, also getting involved in the policy committees um, at Building Memphis and, and, and best, um, because I know that right now we're trying to get a local housing trust fund, um, and I know that Alan's been a good partner with us and, and with that. So uh, yeah, just lending your, your, your support for um, some of the policy platforms that we have and how they may align with the National Association's policies. Austin, uh, yep. for you, I have a question as to the uh, new the new act. Mm -hmm. Probably only what six months really as to being implemented since the judge has been in. I imagine the system's kind of running through it. Um, are you seeing any pitfalls in that in that uh, effect? 
uh, are the act itself and uh, making sure that it's, that it's going down the line so that you can get the receivers in there. Are the receivers being seen pretty, you know, pretty much accepted or are we having a hard time trying to cipher through those folks and their plans to, to basically make it happen? Um, Sean, I think uh, there's a question I had for you which was more settled on with regards to are there any um, are grants going to help your programs more are the three of y'all as to that's what some of the grants are grants going to help the city more so or are we looking at something where we might be able to find some partnerships with some of the banks and being able to figure out to sit down with some of the bankers because i know the bankers are very very interested in helping the community also but they're also they've, they've got a two-edged sword they make they make the loan and then they have to basically, on one, in one sense, they've got acts saying, I need to do this. But in the other sense, they look at the risk factor and they get the guys that are going in and they go, shame on you, you shouldn't have done that loan. And so it's, it's a double-edged sword. They're getting slapped on one and, and another. So those are three. I'd like to you all comment. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief on mine and then uh, there's time to the other. Um, so, for, I think in terms of pitfalls, it really wasn't as much of a pitfall, but just in terms to to really make the full use of the new act, we had to sort of unfile and refile a lot of cases. So to give you the sense of the scale, um, at any given time, the law school uh, clinic um, has about a thousand cases going on against different uh, slum property owners across across the city. And so when the new act passed, they wanted, especially the ones they were having trouble getting what's called service to or re reaching, they wanted to unfile those and refile them under the new act. And so that process is just um, it was sort of like it, we had to reignite the whole car. So we had to turn it off to, to really reignite it so we can experience a new engine, you know? And, and, and so that, that, that's been a, a, a pause in it. But now I think that happened, there was a, a re big refiling a couple weeks ago um, and, and so now we're really seeing that system up and running to its full potential. I think it's getting there. And in terms of your question for receivers, um, to my knowledge, uh, there hasn't been a plan submitted yet. Uh, I think probably within the coming weeks we'll, we'll, we'll see that uh, very soon. Um, but I think speaking with Danny and Brittany and others who are in, in the corner more than I am, they've um, they really, so <coughs> Judge Danders is really excited uh, to to be a part of that and to see some of those plans come to fruition. So I don't know if it's going to be a problem. It's really just going to be how do we get the system together and how do we scale it up. So. Okay. In terms of grants, I didn't mention we, we had the initial investment of 700000 from Pennsylvania financial partners, but we have an additional um, $1.7 million from a philanthropy. And so we are always open to, to additional bank partners or financial institutions investing in our loan fund uh, because they're investing in us. They get CRA credit. They don't have to take the risk. It's ours. We're the investor um, of the loan. But then if they have a certain return they're expecting from us, I mean, they don't, when they give us grants, typically they don't expect the big return. They just we draw pictures and give them a pretty story. <laughs> <laughs> But we are in a position where we can actually provide a return. So we're paying some interest facts. I don't let them off the hook with that risk thing uh, and how they under, because that's the that's same thing as spread money. Um, they are, they are, they're going to automatically say that our neighborhoods are at risk because they, they pull up these fancy analysis. And some bankers are my best friends. You, you wouldn't believe that. I talked about them. <laughs> One was calling me while I was here. Uh, but I, I just don't let them off, their institutions off the hook because we are their bank customers too. We have millions of dollars sitting in deposits in their banks. Uh, and so I always say they want to come out and have these events in our neighborhoods and want our borrowers to make deposits. I see people don't deposit in your bank if you don't make investments in them. And so we're customers at banks that make investments in our neighborhoods. And so and we sit up on millions of dollars in philanthropic dollars that they're sweeping every night. And so, and then we have groups from all over the country who are calling us to buy our portfolio. And we don't want to sell because we're still trying to tell that story over some years. And so they get no credit for that risk story with me because investing in a nonprofit 
it's not risky for them. That's the nonprofit, but for the love are there loans for the individuals? Is that the that you guys can cooperate with too or not? Or is it is it just what you're talking about is can they invest in all? I would probably agree that that's probably something that would not be in the risk factor. Yeah, well, and, they, and they can invest in our borrowers because we're telling the story. They're current, they're not risky, they're not the people that you thought they were. These neighborhoods perform, people want to live here. And so we're suggesting that yes, you can invest in these borrowers and we're helping you do that less risky because we're telling a different story than you. You believe that. But they're not making those loans that yeah. the son's making. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not making the loans that I'm making either. And yeah. we, we're set up in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, we have four different bank investors in, in our in our loan programs. And then we have to land to people on Wall Street that are because, you know, the risk averse. <laughs> so but we don't need we haven't used any of the Golden Wall Street that are so it's just sitting there. So we're gonna bring it down and add it to some of more programs because we don't we don't need that much if any. So, do you guys think that that's a lack of, of uh, communication or, or ability to tell your stories with the, with all the different banks, or is it? I think it's systemic. It's policy driven. Well, it's policy driven, and then if they make the loans that we make, they, well, it's, it's like high cost, right? Because that's that's, that's what they say. say. Because they're charging the fees, and that's the same fees on a hundred thousand dollar loan as it would be on a fifty, forty thousand dollar loan. So it's high, if they get slapped on the wrist, like you're saying, um, by the regulators. So that's what, that's their excuse. That's, that's their, their excuse. But yeah. so remember, I had an NMLS number, <laughs> and so I, I I don't believe. So are they gonna? <laughs> Listen and make the loans. I mean, I, I don't know. They, they aren't currently. Some, they're, they're, some, they're, some are. They're, they're, they're changing slowly. So it, it's changing slowly. And some of them realize that, hey, I'm getting a return, the same return I need. I'm getting a double return because I get the CRA credit and I get paid back. Right. Any other questions? No. I'm just wondering why more. I'm wondering why more nonprofits don't use, in conjunction with the Community Reinvestment Act, why they don't use the community, uh, the CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act, and CITC and THDA. Because those two, the CITC from THDA gives them the break on their franchise and income taxes through the state. And that can still be CRA credit for them. So it needs to East Tennessee uses it a lot, but we don't see it that often in Memphis, and that's something that is underused. It's, it's probably partly a capacity issue on the part of the, the nonprofits, so I'm not going to be just totally mean to the banks, uh, that they're not set up to be lenders. They don't have the staff in place that are skilled to make loans uh, and, and partner with banks to use to encourage them to use the CICC. You can also use the CITC to build too. Yeah. And then again, you know, mm -hmm. it is capacity. So if I'm going to, you know, borrow two million to build something, because my grants reimbursable, government grants are all reimbursable, so you need that up front. And right now it's one and a half percent, so it is the best money you can get uh, out there. So, um, but yeah, it is. You do have to pay it back. And so for a lot of a lot of nonprofits to have to give you that kind of debt, you know, even if it is low. Does everybody know what CITC? Well, it's um, <laughs> banks can lend to nonprofits at four percent, uh, four points below prime, um, and they get their franchise and excise taxes waived. So not only they're able to make these low-cost investments, they get the CRA credit, and then they get their their tax breaks at the end uh, over a certain period. So you can take it all at once, and you can go over a ten-year period, um, and that's how they can do it so cheaply. For us and then we're able to it has to only be for affordable housing um work though it can't be like for commercial yeah. yeah and so then we we earn money because if they're loaning it to us at that rate and when i first started it was zero for me zero. because prime was so low but my borrowers are paying so i'm moving with prime and so they're four and a half four point seven five right. and so we're earning that interest on our side uh so we're earning some money and generate revenue to reuse that purchase. Questions? Hey, this 
um, this is probably directed more to Amy, but to all of you. Um, I'm a bilingual closing attorney. I have a lot of Hispanic clients who are, who are looking for loans. And for one reason or another, they either don't know, they don't have access, or they only have ITIM. So I was wondering if each of you could speak to the success of whatever programs you have for Hispanics and the process and how they how they can reach you or you see what I'm saying? They, they struggle and they don't know about any. I just learned about the ITA moves in the 80s. Wow. Right. I'm, like, I'm like thrilled I'm doing a dance over here. Because <laughs> they come to me with a lot of cash to put down, you know that. Right. But they just can't bring it all together and um, nobody wants to do hard money loans. They're just not out there and, 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 and so Reaching out to that community is important because the children, even if maybe they're undocumented, I know this is a sensitive subject, um, but one-on-one, -on -one, you know, you meet these families, and, and the vast majority are lovely, and their children are legal. You know, their children are here, and giving them a stable environment and a home um, is important for the future of this country and for their future. So if you could speak to that, each one of you, I'd love that. Sure. We haven't been doing a good enough job of my, I, we have one Spanish uh, language uh, speaker counselor on staff, and she spent most of her time in the loan modification and the foreclosure. And now that that program has ended, uh, we're able to pivot and, and to start thinking about uh, how do we uh, work with uh, Latino clients on the buying side. Um, and actually, we've been working with a Latino realtor. Uh, Andres Zuluaga, um, and he has been setting up uh, Spanish-only uh, sort of intro sessions. And so my Nadia here, who was who was here, she's not here anymore, but she um, goes out and introduces who we are and what we can offer. And then if they can make a class, we offer one Sp one class in Spanish um, every month. And uh, right now we just started it, uh, so it hasn't been super full. I think four folks showed up last time. Uh, so we're building up uh, and trying to get the word out more and more, and we're actually working through realtors to do that first. Um, over the years, especially after the election, there was not a whole lot of interest in making roots, and so we, we just sort of, we saw a, lot, a big drop off of people participating in, in home buyer education and ownership and all that. Uh, but now it's picking back up again, and I think that there's a, like you said, a big need for it. Um, a woman came to us, she has um, two kids, and uh, she needed, she had the, like you said, she had the cash, um, and so they put it down, and she actually paid off her, her house in less than two years. So, I mean, and now it's hers, it's hers and her kids, and it's her kids, and then her kids' kids' house, you know, so that's how, how, how it goes. Um, cool. So one of the things that I would um, ask is, ask for you to first, you know, if you know any Spanish-speaking housing counselors that engage with us, we um, believe that through uh, connecting to the housing counselor, it would be an opportunity for them to also become acquainted with other resources, but also for those other resources to be acquainted to them. So as they encounter um, only Spanish-speaking uh, citizens, or I mean people, that they actually know who to actually um, connect them to. Um, some of the things, some of the conversations that we've been involved with the, with this housing authority, and they are trying to like also ramp up their uh, residents that are actually renters and convert them into homeowners. Um, but one of the things that kind of stands in their way in terms of being able to address the, the demand is being able to connect them to the resources that can take care of them. And so as we are expanding on being able to connect Memphis Housing Authority to the housing counselors as a part of the network, we would love the opportunity to engage those housing counselors in those conversations. There have been some policy conversations that we've been having um, to your question a little bit about how can um, grants or banks support um, if we can kind of challenge um, some community benefits agreements or with some of our banks to look at building the capacity of housing counselors. Becoming a housing counselor is not cheap. And then underneath the HUD changes, you have to be a HUD approved agency. And that's also not a cheap process as well. And so if, we're, if we are as a city, as a bank institution, and philanthropy is really intentional about truly investing in home ownership um, and truly investing in an affordable living option that you have the option to choose for, um, I think that that's a start. Um, another thing is, um, you know, Amy stressed it, I can't uh, encourage it enough. Um, but our policy conversations are only informed as the voices that are at the table. Um, you guys see uh, residents a lot more often than probably we do here at Building Memphis. 
Um, we are convening, we work primarily with CBCs, um, and the CBCs deal with the residents, um, but you guys are realtors and you guys have a role in being able to kind of touch and see some of the hurdles that a lot of people who are trying to, you know, get a house encounter. And so if you can come and inform us of some of these issues, we would love to have that. Um, some of the things that I did not get a chance to say um, was we look at issues not only on the city level, but we also monitor things on a state and a federal level as well. There are a couple of legislative proposals that are coming down. Some, in fact, which are looking at um, taking a stab at the Fair Housing Act, making some changes on that end. There are some that's actually um, that are looking at modernizing the CRA and what exactly does that mean? Um, just redefining what community means in a broader sense and you know, looking at you know things that could also weaken um, the way CRA is even examined. And so even that question that you asked is even a tricky question, I believe, because you know <clears throat> there there are a lot of conversations. Um, while we need to be moving forward with being a little bit more intentional and making you know things to think beyond what the current CRA is actually looking for, um, there are also other conversations on the polar side that are looking to. Um, less right or deregulate um, what their banks are actually doing and so that is something that I feel like you should you know they could really be instrumental in um, I said we managed to stay there was one deal that came out um, and I don't know if they got a lot of um, uh, media attention for it but it was a really scary one to think gosh this um, this bill went um, deferred it's not moving anywhere but it was House Bill 614. Um, the way that it was written was not in a way that you would think um, that it was actually meant to do. It was a uh, land, uh, landlord to provide their email address and contact information, but what it in fact was, was it was a bill designed to prevent land from fine uh, landlords um, uh, for housing undocumented um, residents and their um, housing. So it, I, I, I I don't think a lot of people know about this, and we need support. We need your support. We need Hispanic supports. We need um, the Indian support. We need them all. Um, so just if you're interested in helping us to kind of build our coalition on public policy plays, if you're interested in joining us to a trip on Nashville or a trip to DC, like please, I'm trying to build up this policy community, um, but we're only as informed and as powerful as you guys help us to be. The folks are working and have tax IDs, they're paying taxes for work, and then they're paying property taxes when they buy the house. So this is still going towards raising property, uh, uh, building the tax base, and raising property values in the community. So um, no matter your politics, if the numbers are working. <laughs> so we had not, uh, I was glad to hear that Andy was doing that because I was just approached last week by a Latina who was interested in her family members owning it. I was, so I was just going to change our program to fit it because <laughs> we got that flexibility because we're like underwriting origination. We're everything in one. Uh, but I'm glad to see that Amy is doing that. And we just not encounter a lot of Latino uh, borrowers or potential borrowers because of the demographics in the areas where we serve. So in South Memphis, we have one family across the street that was documented. They're Dominican, we just sold them the lot next to them that we used to own, and so now they're expanding. Uh, but they bought that house from us years ago. Uh, and that's like the one Latino family that we have <laughs> in our area, that for, as far as I can see, because they tend to um, be in enclaves in certain parts of the city. So we just don't see as many families, but because that young lady approached me, I was like, so we gotta figure out how we change our whole program to fit their needs, but now we can just send them to the United House. Any other questions? Did you want to say anything? No. Uh, well, thank you guys very much for being here today.